Hi there. Welcome back. So I, I misspoke yesterday. I said I had been a toxicologist for 48 years. I've actually been a scientist interested in directed perturb chemical perturbations in the lab in model organisms. And now I have a lot of other ideas of what kind of systems I should use to study those. Um, I'm rather late for that. But um, I wanted to talk about dose response modeling at the level of single cells and molecules. And then we're going to have a, a, a group, three of us, come, three more of our colleagues come up to talk about this. Um, now let's see if I can do this. Starting in the late 1980s, some of us were interested in the fact that we see um, chemical perturbations working at a cellular level. If you dose animals with compounds that cause what we used to call enzyme induction, you find out that the induction occurs in single cells, all or none, and as you increase the dose, more cells get involved. Depending on the compound, it goes from one end of the liver to the other, or the reverse. Um, was done both in vitro first by Cliff Elkins and his student Remy Bars. Um, so Remy Bars is now not just a student, he's quite is well on in years, but um, and then it was done also at um, NIEHS, um, looking at the liver, and, and that's what's shown um, in a series of slides. As you get increasing dose, you get larger regions of the liver that are actually affected. Um, you should look at the authors up here, at least the first two, um, me and Linda Birnbaum, worked on um, some of this, and that was actually trying to describe this process with, with a, a, a model, a model for the both distribution of a compound dioxin causing the effect and then where it occurred in the liver. So we actually had to make a picture of the liver. So it's the only time in my career after taking calculus in 1967 that I got to use polar coordinates to actually draw a structure. And um, the polar coordinate structure of the, of the asinus there. And then we were able to do, kind of do an simulation and then paint the structure with increasing colors. Um, and then down the bottom, it shows some work that was done both at the level of the liver to look at CYP1A1, um, which actually has a huge dynamic range, 10,000 fold. And we could actually look at a region at low doses where nothing was happening, and then a rapid increase. And we had to actually look to see how we would model that. Um, but I want, so this is single molecule here and single cells. You see the responses at those two levels. Um, we actually use a really sophomoric model, which is called the Hill equation. Um, in the Hill equation, there's a number, the term n. The, the larger n is, the more it looks like a switch. We had to use really high levels, 5 to 10 which are not really biologically realistic. Um, and the question is, what's going on? How do we get a cell to respond in this way? And really, when you think about it, it's not a... So we have the, a ligand binding a receptor, and that, that acts as a transcriptional factor. But it's not just the one single enzyme that's being induced. There's hundreds, sometimes thousands. If, if it were a process by which you create... Um, receptor bound to ligand and, and bind to a thousand individual promoter areas, that's a competitive problem. This is a concerted issue that goes on in the cell. It goes from one state to another. Um, now, what's the process by which this can occur? And how do cellular networks change to control these phenotypes? Um, a good bit of work has gone on to actually look at this process. You've heard about it yesterday. Um, I can't I'll just step up. Uh, so this is conceptually by Lewis and that's by science, single trans transduction knowledge environment in 2002, asking questions about differential responses if you look at population. <laughs> sorry, about Okay, I'm sorry. Um, oops. So this idea of whether you're looking at, oh, let's see. Uh, this is high tech. It's the green one. I want you to go back. You want to go back. 
All right, there you go. You have to be persistent. Um, whether you're looking, as we talked yesterday, about a, trying to look at the whole population of cells, in this case, the work was done with oocyte maturation, um, showing the difference if you look at responses um, in the population, whereas overdose, the population looks like it shifts. But if you can look at single cells, the response is all or none. Just, as you go up in dose, you have basal cell, so finally, at the highest concentration is all induced. This work was done um, mostly by uh, Jim Farrell. Key work on this kind of issue of cellular switches, how you go from one state to another abruptly with the perturbation, <laughs> the chemical perturbation. Um, it was done by Farrell in the group at Stanford. Um, I, um, John Tyson looking at cell, cy cell cycle characteristics. And when they looked at this process of looking at MAP kinase phosphorylation as a function of progesterone, if you look at it in the population, you get a nice, what's called Michaelis menton, N equals one. And if you look at single cells, you see that cells are either in one state or another. One state or another. And they actually did a, they made an estimate of this N value of 35. It just means it's a switch. The process that they undertook actually the series of studies to understand this. And I'm not going to describe them all, but uh, so as a person interested in direct chemical perturbations and model systems, um, I'm interested in how much it takes to cause the effect. This is a dose response. What the effect is in this transition from no effect to an effect. Of a dose response curve. How can it occur so abruptly? So, yesterday Raj talked about some of the process of modeling networks. And what we have here, are, I'm sorry, let's see. This Ferrell's work, and this is a review they did, and progesterone, which causes this stimulation, works through a, a MAP kinase ca cascade. And there's a positive feedback loop here. So almost all of these responses, these phenotypic changes, occur because of nonlinearities in these feedback loops. Positive feedback, double negative feedback, a whole series of, um, of arranged circuitry. And the so cells have these little circuits in, inside. They respond to perturbations to give us dose response. So that's a picture of the chemical characteristics, the arrangement. This is a depiction of the feedback loops. It kind of works um, with MAP kinases and the cyclins. And then this is the vocabulary of what happens. As the concentration of progesterone goes up, you get to a bifurcation spot, and then you abruptly go from one state to another. So I'm also interested in toxicology. Oops, well, you know what? It, this is the shorthand for what I've been doing. Um, whether it's an irreversible or a reversible effect. So with the maturation of the oocyte, you, after you go and make this transition, you get to another region, and if you decrease the progesterone, it's stuck. It's an irreversible process, and that's this hysteresis in the. Some, so positive feedback, by stability, and hysteresis. There's a response, and there's how we get it. A good deal of work has been done by others and my colleagues when I was at Hamner. How do you create these switches? Um, this is work that was done as a perspective on a paper by Upinda um, Bala and Ravi Iyengar on a um, platelet-derived growth factor network, um, but there's a whole series of mechanisms by which you can create these um, switches, all of which have some type of feedback. And I've got two parts of my little talk here. This is the beginning one, and I'm going to quit, and then I stop later. But um, colleague Chung Zhang and Shudan and uh, I and others um, actually published a paper in Environmental Health Sciences about these a mechanistic basis for cellular threshold responses. 
I guess two things that we actually they wanted to emphasize was they're, they're more common than actually is appreciated within toxicology. Where we, when we look at aggregations of cells or what goes on in an, organ, in an intact organism. And that, um, I think, this is the, uh, so we have in silico, in statistico, and what was the other one, Raj? In simulo. In simulo. So this is, the, this is the issue of in simulo. We don't have enough appreciation when we actually talk about toxicology and talk about those responses of the processes which give rise to those responses, the underlying components of how they interact. And this understanding the quantitative aspects of these motifs um, relevant for toxicity perturbations is an integral component, and it's been neglected. Uh, and, it's a, it's a, and it really needs to be part of the training that we do um, in, in terms of dose response. And then for us in toxicology, how we bring the tools we're hearing about here and this has been a marvelous, marvelous day and a half for, for people. Um, even for age-impaired people, trying to put this into perspective for what it means. But st as I said yesterday, it's still how does we how do we take this data, organize it, and use it? Okay, I may have taken a little too much time, but that's that's all for now. And um, we're going to go and have some comments from three distinguished colleagues, and I don't know how we want to, you want to go in order and start, so. I guess Lana, we have Lana, Michael, and Casillas, okay. So, um, is this a five minutes um, question and answer kind no. of thing? Five minute presentation and, and some discussion. Your thoughts. Uh -huh. yes. Okay, so um, for the questions that I was given is, um, I believe is um, for the identification modes of action. So let's say um, if, let's say if, the, if a system is giving to some perturbation, like what he just mentioned, how do the cells respond? Do they respond um, unanimously, or do they respond with differentiation, a difference uh, among the different uh, uh, cell subtype, tissue subtypes, given the perturbation? So that was the mode of action question that I was giving. Um, I think my answer before, when I practiced, uh, my answer was, was uh, simply it depends. <laughs> it really depends on the system that you're working on. And it really depends on what is the trigger of stimulus. So uh, it has, if you think about it, this is like a, a machinery, you know, there. Uh, there's a trigger coming in, and then the machine is supposed to produce some kind of response. Uh, it really has to do with the input, the, 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 the variables coming in, the function, that operates on this variable input, and then it gives you response. So, simply speaking, it, going back to you know old days when you study high school uh, math, it's a function, you know, taking an input of f x. So here, it really depends on what is x is. Is x very mild um, agent, or is something hugely to toxic? So, so there's a, a big variety of what kind of input there is. And also, you know, the, the machinery that operates on top of this, on top of the signals, the input, it really, it really varies from system to system. Um, for example, you know, uh, I do a lot of cancer studies, right? So at the single cell level, we know that now, you know, it's well accepted that um, for each individual person, that tumor from that person is not all the same. The, the tumor, that is tumor clump, it's actually can arrive from several different colonies. And those different colonies have very different properties in terms of their you know, growth potential, in terms of regenerative uh, property, uh, and also you know, given the environmental stimulus, how do they react? 
to to the stimulus as a response. So it's very very different. And because of that, I think now you know it's really the critical time for us to look at the precision medicine perspective. And I'm hoping techniques such as single cell sequencing can actually really help us towards that direction, right? So you can imagine if this patient have. Um, if this patient has several different subcolonies, uh, first thing you need to figure out is which 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 subcolony has the most potential to grow, or another question is which subcolony has the most potential to repopulate itself and take take over when this person is hit with either radiation or chemotherapy, right? So because of that, and also beyond the tumor uh, subclonies themselves, other people, speakers early on already talked about <clears throat> there are many other cell types in there, including immune cells. Those immune cells, traditionally they are thought, you know, they are hijacked by the tumor to act, you know, as a facilitator for the enemies to combat your body. So there's a lot of crosstalk as well between different cell types. Uh, and different sub subcolonies. So if you think about this this picture, visualizing this picture in your mental, uh, in, in your brain, uh, I really think the response is really dependent on what are the cell types we're, we're looking at, what is their intrinsic property, and also uh, how the information, your know, trigger information and input passes through the cell body and gets out and spread and diffuse, passing among the the, the different cell types, how do they cross talk to each other? So it's not a really simple answer to that. Uh, but I, I, I do feel like with, you know, finite uh, technology like single cell, it can give us this kind of snapshots of, you know, what happens to, uh, to the stimulus before giving it and after giving it. Does that make sense? I know that it's a, it's practically difficult if, uh, on the solid tumor, for example. You, you take the biopsy, and then you look at those cells, and next time when you look at the response, you're not looking at exactly the same cells anymore, even if you can get the biopsy sample. But I think it, uh, it's probably more sensible when you look at a liquid tumor, for example, right? You look at uh, the blood. Blood, uh, the, the blood population and give it a, a dose and then you watch, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours to see how the patient responded to that kind of dose. Thank you. It sounds like you're, what you're saying is that this. Do you hear me? No, it's going on. Let go. Let go. No, you can push it. Okay. Aha. Um, well, Lana, one thing it sounded to me like you were talking about there's multiple mechanisms of action that you want to look at in the process of watching differences in progression to tumors, the, the um, cytokines that are being released and moving about, the alterations in cells over time, and the nature of the cells in the, in the population. There's definitely, like you said, you were talking about the feedback loop. There's loop too. You know, intrinsically, there are signaling, cell signaling pathways, right? There's genetic ne uh, network also. And then outside of the cell membrane, there's signals, growth factors that are diffusive, and they can actually propagate the signals from one cell to other cells. So things don't really grow linearly. The messages are not passed down linearly. So I was asked to talk about diver adversity, uh, which in assays that we have been doing for years, it seems very, very far removed from, for example, a nuclear translocation assay. How is adversity down the road, if we're finding something mechanistic, an endocrine disruptor is affecting something, how is that connected to risk out in the population? It's very far removed from the basic scientist's point of view. Which is why I think we continue, and maybe uh, we do this perhaps too much, I guess. We're constantly trying to get as much mechanism uh, out of every single thing that we do. Uh, the 
typical screening assays. Uh, we, we run a big screening assay, uh, screening center in Houston as well. And they're often very simple, simple assays. Does this bind that? How does that go downstream to uh, adversity? You know, it's very abstract. When we build assays, as I mentioned yesterday, where we're growing cells, you know, generic cells on plastic, that's not terribly brilliant in the uh, long run, in the short run. We use that to get as much mechanism as we can in the right context. Not 10 different kinds of assays with different cell models and different approaches. Uh, the closer we get to better understanding the mechanism of action in our models, I think, down the road, it's better for defining adversity. In the Superfund project that we started last year, as mentioned yesterday, we're getting to the point where we're actually getting real samples out there in the world from uh, hurricane uh, floodwaters that end up in people's houses. What's in it, we don't know. We have to do mass spec and all that, and there's groups that are doing that, but we want to do something fast and meaningful. Can we have assays that maybe throw a sample on? We do quick reading. I mean, in a half an hour or an hour, we know if there's something happening to the, the nuclear receptors in our models. Are they the perfect model? Not yet. We want to go into three-dimensional uh, assays. We're doing that in more simplistic uh, experiments and, uh, and other projects, but we need to build them and engineer them so that the physiology improves, the mechanism that we can read out improves, and context improves. That, I think, is the, is the route to having a better answer on, on risk down this, downstream. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would really like the approach that the inflammation and especially trying to see um, the role of microphages in all, all kinds of diseases, you know, from liver toxicity to brain toxicity and so on. So there are certain positives there for isolating cells and studying them. I'm going to pick up on question, the first question, two situations, and I'm going to take the number two, and I'm going to reverse it. I'm going to say 95% of the cells are responding, or 5%, or even 2% of the cells do not respond. And uh, what happens in this, and what can we learn? This is perhaps not a dose-response direct uh, relationship, but uh, I'm taking the, the case of tumors and cancer stem cells. As you all know, cancer stem cells are the cells that are very resistant to either chemotherapy, radiation, or a combination of that. And it doesn't take that long. It takes less than 0.5% of this population to just um, have the cancer relapse or even um, also the um, spread out of these, uh, uh, of these cells throughout the body. So what is the mechanism of those cancer stem cells and how do we address that? So there are several ways that, you know, they uh, already there are stem cells, there are seven markers for these stem cells that we can properly, when we introduce to the RNA-seq of a patient that we heard very nicely from many of the talks, especially the breast cancer talk, you can probably talk about the possibility of these tumors to be resistant on, on a particular uh, treatment, and um, that could vary from, from everything. So there are a lot of aspects of isolating and studying those single cells and single cells population that they have a major contribution to the phenotype, which in this case is cancer. Um, I think we need to continue. Um, our studies on the single cells, and you know, I think um, we should, you will, we will get really meaningful uh, data, especially for clinical practice. So, I, I'd like to just ask two questions. So, when you talk about mode of action, and you have um, stem cells that are resistant? I mean, to, to some extent, you're talking about a population difference in the cells, within the stem cells, and then some issue that would be required to understand the genotype of the stem cells that has now rendered them um, insensitive. Yes. And how, how do the... So that's the mode of action for this, this process. And how would the... Um, 
tools that we've talked about? How are the tools that we've talked about helping you to answer that question? That's, uh, that's a very good. First of all, there is existing literature of, of those kind of biomarkers existing on those cells. So if you take a, any tumor and you can grind up and you can isolate, you can use fax analysis to isolate for either um, other uh, cell, uh, the um, surface markers or you know, cytosolic markers. You can identify the genotype and then you can identify the population. Then you can really uh, study. The point is, what does it cause this kind of, um, of um, resistance? What is the agent? Is, is a chemical? Is the oxidative stress caused by radiation that in, triggers um, pathways that will make those cells resistant to the treatment, either chemical or you know, radiation-induced based, again, all of them on oxidative stress? So the genotype, first of all, will tell you you know, from the heterogeneous cells of the tumors, if you have some cells that they have high probability of getting resistance. And then you can also decide of what kind of treatment you want to give to these patients. So, for example, I'll give you one of my areas of research is aldehyde dehydrogenases. You can isolate um, cancer stem cells based on aldehyde dehydrogenase of this, and then you can actually see on the population now with RNA seq if the transcription of this gene is really upregulated. So then you can decide, okay, in addition to this treatment, I will also give an inhibitor of the aldehyde dehydrogenase and will have better success of deleting those cells. And of course, there would be a, a further heterogeneity of those cells. So what we're doing now is we're doing fax analysis, isolating those cells, and then characterizing those cells with various uh, methods, including the rna seq Raj Vadigapali, Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia. It's uh, basically the, the point you bring up about switching the one and two there into a, a rarer populations, I suppose, uh, is very interesting. Uh, I, I was think relating that to the adversity concept, and it occurs to me that uh, the interpretation of all this, the phenotype has to be the anchor around which we interpret everything else because ultimately whatever biomarkers there are, specific molecular interactions, assays, we project it off to what is the impact and potential impact on the phenotype, right? That's what we're trying to do. And uh, my, my comment basically is the when we get to a single cell, data sets are that kind of a high resolution view. There is much, much variability variation as we have seen. And the need is for us to really understand which variation in probably a rare subtype, in a rarely detectable cell subtype, that propagates all the way through the tissue interactions and physiology and everything else to uh, out of proportionately influence the phenotype. I think th that's the kind of understanding that we would like to develop on the stem cell example, cancer stem cell example you bring up is like a, a classic thing for that, right? Classic uh, uh, instance of that. So are there uh, uh, examples of that kind outside of a cancer where we would basically say uh, a small variation in, in some mode of action, I suppose, in, in a small cell type that would pretty much make an A or an A into a phenotype, uh, and uh, yeah, they're conserved principles of some kind, organizational principles of biology that we can then say, if we see this uh, uh, in, in other uh, disease contexts with single cells, then this is how it's likely going to affect, so that's where we have to organize ourselves. Can we take this, something about the principle of stem cells affecting, uh, leading to tumor resistance? How generalizable is that? It's, I think it's very, uh, well, it's very generalizable, but remember, you have to study everything and all the details in terms of its cell type. None of these cells will have the same mechanism of action. I mean, I just presented you the aldehyde dehydrogenase, but there are also other cells like glutathione, increase of glutathione on these cells and so on. So to answer your question is, how do we generate a, a, a deep learning 
system that we can incorporate all this data together and get to a models that we can really use on clinical practice. That's my whole point is, I mean, we're doing a lot of things in tissue culture and, you know, or small doses and everything, but how we can really incorporate that along with the real life data that you have from patients that we know that they're resistant, they can come back with a relapse or metastasis, and you can study those cells. So, and remember, is um, the, the cells, the DNA is a very dynamic element. So there are also some mutations that might occur within the tumor responding to the, um, to the treatment that will enable those cells. So we need to study a lot of the genotype along with other characteristics in order to have a better answer for the phenotype. Just a very quick follow-up on that, which is that from a mathematical perspective, it, it, it's uh, the, and we, we do this all the time in simulations and in statistical analysis, uh, of all the things that can vary, only a few variations really matter, and matter in terms of which phenotype you're looking at. And we right. employ that in a sensitivity analysis all the time, depending on what you're looking for uh, in a sensitivity analysis as an outcome variable, a completely different uh, underlying you know, uh, parameter influences it, right? So it uh, seems like anchoring the phenotype as we are collecting the single cells is crucial, and it's not entirely clear to me if we have that understanding of propagation of variation through the whole physiology. We that, go ahead. You brought up a good point. So I, I truly feel like for the, for the single cell field to move forward, it cannot just go forward by itself. Uh, we'll also benefit from other complementary uh, phenotypic measurements, high throughput perhaps based like imaging imaging techniques that can give you like immediate readout of what happened at the phenotype level. So, you know, with these tools as well as following up with patient response and collect more samples over time, I, I think it's a hopeful uh, we'll be able to kind of um, identify the uh, the source of, of, of of the cause of triggering those, those uh, leading to those phenotype changes. <laughs> no. Well, to the to the my left. Thank you, Mel. Risha Putzrath, Navy Marine Corps Public Health Center, and as a federal employee, I must say that my views are my own, not representing those of the Navy or the Department of Defense. But it's actually good to come to me because it's sort of a more generic riff off of the first question, which is. I've left the lab three decades ago, so I'm in the pragmatic use of the data you guys are generating, which is awesome, by the way. Uh, but I wanted to bring up a couple points that I find I'm having conflicts within in terms of translating the information you have and see what you think about them and if you have any ideas on how to resolve them. The first one is use of mode of action, whether at the cellular level or the systemic level, is great for doing commonalities and having us be able to look at chemicals or other agents together, not each individually. However, we're all aware of the exceptions to every rule. Or as my linguistic friend told me recently, and I love this analogy, the irregular verbs of science. Those irregular verbs can be the most important for really understanding what's going on. At the same time, two of the recommendations that have, over the recent decade or so, come out of the National Academy are to do risk assessments in terms of both systematic reviews so that you have a good way and a somewhat objective way of looking at the literature, but at least currently as done, tend to focus on the chemical, not related chemicals or modes of action and also risk assessments that are fit for purpose, which tend to be by route of exposure or endpoint, where we also know that to really understand the mode of action, you have to look at the other effects on the other systems or the other routes of exposure. So with all those different competing ideas that silo things in ways that are useful but not necessarily handling the 
chemical or exposure that you are trying to assess, how do you suggest we take these data and still do an analysis that we have a fair amount of confidence in, but we're able to accomplish in less than a year and sometimes in terms of a month or so? I am a data person. I, I, I'm I, not an environmental scientist per se, but uh, uh, recently I started to work on uh, pharmacogenetics data. So I can share with you some of my thoughts from this area. Um, as far as I know, there have there has been a lot of studies accumulated at the cell culture, you know, the the, the cell cell system. The uh, there's this this great tool called L1000 from Broad Institute. You know, Broad can do anything. Uh, so they have they have put together. I think it's like one million different types of compounds, or at least one million different experiments. <laughs> many many different compounds there. Some are drugs. Some are just compounds. We don't even know what they are there for. But you know, they just did experiments on gene expression. So one thing that one you can think of doing is to leverage information from those other uh, data sets, uh, databases that are not necessarily designed for single cell, but you can utilize some of the information there that can help you to speed up your discovery. That's my, my, my thought towards that, in order to get it uh, in, there in one year without a you know, systematic design. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Uh, very quick. I mean, your point you're breaking is very important, and I'm, I'm an environmental health scientist, and this is what we're trying to address. Systematic reviews are good, but not good enough. Uh, they will give you a lead of what has been done, because sometimes they cannot cover all the areas of this. I'm going to take you a very small example, and actually that's what we have applied for our super fund, trying to see the effects of emerging water contaminants, and such as dioxane, which is found in the drinking water. So if you look at this, it's a probable carcinogen, but there is no really clear mode of action. Most likely, it's hepatocarcinogen. But how do we, this, and you know, the studies have shown so far, it's either, it's not genotoxic, it's not non-genotoxic carcinogen, somewhere in the middle. So we don't have a mode of action. So in most of the cases, in, in some of the cases, we might don't know. Okay, and that's why I think single cell approaches would really help us identify some of mode of actions which are rather unique and they're public threats too. A quick comment on the one year time point you're talking about, you mentioned. Get a good answer within a year. From the context of, of what we're trying to do, a year, waiting a year to find out if what's in the waters or the junk that came out of the sediments into someone's house, that's not helpful. And if we can't get an answer quicker, then I think to a large extent it becomes just an abstract exercise. Telling somebody that here's this list of, of junk that was in your house a year ago, or fine, maybe there's something you can monitor the rest of your life. You've been exposed to X, Y, and Z. Uh, but getting answers have, has got to be faster. And that's why some of the high throughput approaches from various sources uh, can do at least some of that. And that's, I think, an important part of the early response. Just really quickly, so this piece of the morning is more on mode of action. Mm -hmm. And then once we transition, we're going to talk a little more about applications and risk assessment. And I think your question actually um, overlaps in both of those areas. So we'll come back to it a bit. Thank you all for the presentations. Lisa Aylward from Summit Toxicology. Um, I'm interested in whether or not there is a um, role for doing some bridging between taking these technologies that we've been talking about, and the single cell technologies particularly, and applying them in some of the toxicological models that have been developed that are somewhat more high throughput. So I think, I'm thinking things like zebrafish for developmental um, types things, because I'm, I'm struck over and over again in these presentations by the process of cell 
differentiation or, or changing cell differentiation and how you, how you may be reprogramming uh, a tissue development and whether or not we can take these technologies with, with systems where, which we've already studied with chemical exposures fairly extensively, some of these model systems, and understand more about what those pathways are um, in terms of the this, using these single cell analysis, how do these cell populations change? Is there a, is there a we don't, I don't want to redo a lot of animal experiments, right? we, you know, for chemicals. But is there a role for doing some bridging studies where we have experimental models that we've used in toxicology, where we've looked at some of these key processes, not only cancer but maybe developmental effects or or immunological changes, and bridge those with the, some of these new technologies so that our former understanding and our new understanding can kind of come together to inform how we might go forward for broader classes of chemical or, or effect risk assessments. That's an excellent point, and I agree, and I think there are already methods utilizing the zebrafish that we can take questions, we can answer questions to a much faster, that wouldn't take a year, but you can have a high throughput screening, and at the same time, you can use this model to a single cell, mo I mean, we have several examples from either RNA-seq or, you know, even the tissue imaging on that. So I agree with you, and that's where we need to go. That's what we really need to get to, um, to utilize those kind of models, such as the zebrafish. I, I think that there has been a publication already for zebrafish, uh, Atlas already, at the single cell resolution. Yep, okay. Uh, Kim Bucklehead at Brown University. So <clears throat> I'm sort of responding to the first prompt at the top here in the context of mode of action and in the context of what we've heard at this uh, workshop. So I'm going to sort of read a tautology here, and I'm interested in whether you agree. Uh, so subtyping of cells can identify true responders. So in the first prompt, the question is, are 10% of the cells responding at 100% or are all the cells responding at 10%? So I think the techniques we heard about can actually help us answer that question. Uh, so subtyping of cells can identify true responders. A mode of action is related to these responding subpopulations. Okay, and then three, Studying these responding cells will improve our understanding of mode of action. So that's sort of a tautology, but I wonder, does, do you want me to read that again, Mel? <laughs> I, I, don't wanna, I wanna know if you agree with that. So it, it's sort of a tautology, but it is well, the basis. Show, show you want me to do it again? Please. Step at a time. Subtyping of cells can identify true responders. I think that's sort of what we heard. Uh, mode of action is related to these responding subpopulations. And studying these responding cells will improve our understanding of mode of action. I assumed you <laughs> <laughs> So I think there are two things as I listen to the applications here. One is that in toxicology, when we study dose response, that what we may have are systems in which, if the dose were high enough, we would have a 100% response. But as we look across dose, we see fractional numbers of cells discreetly being activated. And I think in, in, in for most of the things that we study in toxicology, where we're trying to start with a more homogeneous population of cells, um, I would say that subtyping is actually looking at response more than it is individual susceptibility. All right. Um, the, the, the second part is true whether or not you're right or I'm right, and that is <laughs> that the, the goal here is to understand the mode of action of that. Um, I think especially in disease processes or looking at the issue of inter-individual susceptibility that there may be a larger role for assessing whether or not a cell is capable of responding and then whether it responds in an all or none fashion. Okay. 
I, I think we, we, we have the mode of action experts here that they can weigh in as well. A comment on the, the generic 10% issue. Uh, something that's connected to what we've been loosely associated with for a while, you know, estrogen receptor and our basic reductionistic models. But at the same time, people are looking at tumors and doing estrogen receptor labeling. And for a while, it seemed that there were 10% of the cells in a tumor, you better treat it, that are positive for ER, you better treat it. Well, then that came down lower, 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 and now it's 1% or something. And what we're finding in model systems, uh, that level is so small to have an effect. I think that the reason all those numbers have come down is that it doesn't take much. And it immediately goes to the issue of sensitivity and specificity of the probes and things that we're using. At the same time, that's even more complicated because however many estrogen receptors there are, and there's an antibody to it, they're not all the same. They're not all functioning the same way. Add the post-translational modification story to it, and it explodes with complexity. We're nowhere near knowing which of those molecules and, and being able to label them to bring, you know, 0.1% of a population is important, or, or 2 or 10 or 20. That is still an ongoing thing, and, and I believe that getting at that kind of specific and sensitivity uh, for, for the detection of any of the molecules we're interested in has, has got to continue improving and then be blended with some of the other systems. Not everything's going to be done with one assay. I know that. But the orthogonal stuff has to come into play. But sensitivity, specificity is, I still think, needing <coughs> great improvement. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Shudin Bharacharya from Michigan State. Um, um, uh, my question is, is sort of tied to the maybe the third bullet or the second bullet point there, how is adversity defined when using single cell or single molecular endpoints? Uh, we've seen beautiful characterizations both in health and disease of these um, uh, uh, of these SORA plots, the T-SNE plots of uh, uh, multicolored populations of cells and how they might be perturbed. So it seems to me that they are maybe tied to this question of a percentage of cells responding or all or none. Uh, you can have two fundamental maybe kinds of alterations in the cell clouds, right? I mean, the population, subpopulations can move under perturbation, or, um, or you know, the distributions change, become narrower or broader, or the, sub the subgroups, the locations of the subgroups stay more or less the same in terms of gene expression patterns, but, um, you know, the, 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 um, the population distribution changes. One cloud becomes more populated with cells and another, another cloud thins out. Um, so towards, in an attempt to get towards modes of action, can we start drawing maybe boundaries around healthy states? Uh, I'm not quite yet ready to throw out Weddington's canalization and cell states. I still believe there is some, you know, cell states are buffered and somewhat stable, healthy states. Can we start drawing some sort of a conceptual boundary around cell clouds that identify healthy states? To, and sort of say that these are the boundaries we should not be crossing to try to lay out maybe modes of action and some kind of a quantitative approach based on single cell studies towards going, moving towards risk assessment. I really like that. Uh, uh, I, I like I like your your idea, and I agree. I think uh, you know perhaps right now the fundamental thing, the first thing we need to figure out is w w what defines a healthy state? You know, what are the norm? What is normal? We need to have the boundaries defined for those normals. And then, you know, what is the abnormal, right? You have to first know what's normal. Uh, as far as I know, you know, for all those diseases, the number of samples that are sampled are not enough in terms of, you know, comparing to the population epidemiological study, traditional speaking, where, you know, you have tens of thousands of people being assayed. Here, what I hear a lot of times is you have tens of people, or normal people, but I don't know if that's what is supposed to be the norm, and is that sufficient for us to draw where the norm boundary is, is. so um, somebody needs to do a power study. Even if you have a better understanding of what's normal over, pick a number, a thousand people or ten thousand, you're still going to be facing outlier issues that 
how will that cloud, that those gorgeous clouds that we've seen so many of, that morph a little bit this way or that way, how can you decide where the, the morph is important? What's the statistical part, which I'm not the guy to ask about those questions, but uh, it has to happen at some point. Uh, to add a complexity on top of that, each individual, even if they are normal, absolutely normal, they are different in terms of gender, ethnicity, age, all sorts of things. The, you know, ha habit, living habit, dietary, vegetarian versus non-vegetarian. So <laughs> I, I think this is going to be gigantic, uh, you know, from a statistical point of view, it needs to be have some kind of, kind of regression model to, at the, at the cloud level, let us figure out, you know, after adjusting all of those, those variation factors, what is a norm cloud? And to add a little bit more to the complexity, you have to take into account also cell-cell interactions, right? What you think it's a healthy and what you think it's an outlier, what is the interaction between these populations? These are valid points which I think they will need to be addressed slowly, but it's a very good thought also. I think it's a lovely thought. However, I, I, I would say again, it's, I'm having a little trouble balancing an issue and the, the multiple uses for this kind of information. The idea of we have a, a landscape and a tissue and the, uh, the tissue when perturbed can land in different places. That perturbation could be inherited, genetic. Um, it could be a result of a disease process which has altered that network. And then there's this issue of how we, how we look at a chemical's perturbation of a system kind of in the, the clean systems we try to use in toxicology and ask what are the perturbations that we generate in, a, in the laboratory or in a test environment that are indicative of a move to a new landscape where the cells adjust differently and can we identify the characteristic changes there that have occurred? And then to the extent, would they be considered an adverse marker? And, and can we actually go on at that point and ask, are there cases in a human population where these may be pre-existing? And, and then actually bring that into the toxicology area. So I, I see... We, we talk about these technologies, but the way they get used will be different um, for these kind of questions that we, we ask. Hi, Catherine McClelland, NIH. I have two, two comments based on these um, topics we've been discussing. The first is that when you're looking at representation, such as in the first prompt, that is a problem that can be solved relatively easily mathematically in a single cell data set. And actually, if you do account for is there a small percentage of the cells highly expressing in a cluster or not? You, in fact, actually get a whole new layer of information about that tissue. And I think that's something that's not accounted for in workflows at the moment that we really need to be conscious of. The second is this kind of concept of what is normal. And I think we can learn a lot from the psychology field and, and epidemiology in terms of the concept of individuality in that if you only classify normal as the average between everyone you've seen, that normal doesn't really actually represent a real person at all. And you're not going to find that average person because that person is a construct of what you've created. And I think that's a really important thing for us to think about, especially when we look at disease states and when the, we also then presumably tease that apart by going into model organisms. Patrick McMullen from Cytovation. Um, so this, this, this workshop was convened by the Emerging Science for Environmental Health Decisions panel. Um, and one thing I was thinking about is that pretty much, well, it might not even be pretty much, it might be absolute, that all environmental health decisions are based on bulk level data. 
Um, that's not to say that the assumptions uh, behind the decision making doesn't take into account single cell level data. Um, for instance, uh, genotoxic carcinogens uh, are, are regulated differently than uh, non-genotoxic carcinogens because uh, the assumption is that if you get hit with one molecule of, uh, uh, of, uh, of chemical X, one, one ion of the gamma radiation, the, that, that you're increasing your risk. Whereas for non-genotoxic carcinogens, maybe there's uh, uh, biological reasons why uh, cells would be able to buffer against that. Um, so my, what, that is a little bit of a, a monologue to, 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 to ask that first question in, in a little bit of a different way. Is there, given that there are, there's a, a disconnect between kind of the, the, the level at which we're collecting data for, for tox decision making and the, the, the level where we're making assumptions, is there, is there a way we could bring those together uh, given that, uh, that, that we have the ability to measure that now? We, I mean, frankly, we didn't when these paradigms emerged. If I may, Mel, if I may. I'm not going to answer it. Okay. <laughs> my former EPA employee hat on, having gotten out the cancer guidelines and supplemental guidance, um, first of all, it's not genotoxic mode of action, it's mutagenic mode of action. And that's important for those of us who come out of genetic toxicology because the two are not the same. The second thing that the draft guidance that, to my knowledge, has never gone final on what defines a mutagenic mode of action, the, the EPA um, risk assessment forum group that tried to define that post hoc because the guidance was already out, came across one major stumbling block, which is that all tumors, cancer tumors, eventually have a mutation. So the fact that an agent causes a mutation and causes cancer cannot define a mutagenic mode of action because that would be all cancers and therefore wouldn't, as, as a mode of action, be useful. So the draft guidance that came down on, given the examples that are in the supplemental guidance, is either the chemical or its immediate metabolite must cause the mutation. And though this isn't in the draft guidance, there's some publications that have come out since that talk about the fact that um, Ideally, you want to know that the mutation is caused in vivo in the tissue where the cancers occur, because I believe there's at least one chemical which does cause mutations in the rodent species, but not in the organ where the cancers appear. So it's, it, I want to be, clarify that because it's become very generic and facile. It causes mutations, it causes cancer, therefore, and it has, even though the, the uh, mechanism guidance never came out, we have to, as a scientific community, think of it more narrowly. However, we care to define it, it can't just be it causes mutations and it causes cancer. Thank you. So, so let me let me add one more point real quick. O originally, I was thinking because I, I think I actually maybe I wrote this prompt. Um, but uh, originally, I was thinking that, that those two situations, one and two, were, were drastically different in their implication for how we would make decisions. But now, I'm, after the last day and a half, I'm not, I'm not sure anymore. My goal in the next discussion is to actually bring that up again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I was thinking about the tautology that came offered a bit earlier and possibly offer a way out of it a bit, maybe. Uh, because what I was thinking of was that the, the subtypes that respond, right, the mode of action is related to that. I think that's the second point that you're mentioning, Kim. Is, uh, I would offer that the potential, many things change, and we, we actually won't know which of those subtypes or which of those changes that occur in, in the variabilities that move around are even related to the outcome back. So the way in to find those is not necessarily the way out, trying to figure out which one of those propagate up to influence the outcome, which is about the third point. So as long as the 
the way in to find the subtype from exposure in and trying to show the uh, upward propagation of those changes influencing the outcome is not the same. Maybe we break the circular argument. It's some, something to consider. Right, right. So as long as we, we're not, we, we, we're not uh, uh, sort of self-referencing why something is important because it changes, then it, it, it's okay, I think. I think we break the tautology. I think. We're on schedule. Yes. Good. All right.